There is genioglossus coming from the little genial tubercles on the inside of the front of the mandible. This is generally regarded as the bulk of the muscle, but I don't really believe this is true. I think that these are two fairly thin plates of muscle within the center of the tongue, and the bulk of the tongue itself are the intrinsic muscles. Genioglossus is supplied by the hypoglossal nerve. Then there is styloglossus from the styloid process coming forwards into the posterior aspect of the tongue and interdigitating with the other muscles. This muscle will pull the tongue backwards and help with the transmission of the bolus of food from the front to the back of the mouth. And lastly is the odd man out. This is the palatoglossus which comes from the posterior edge of the hard palate and runs down into the posterior lateral surfaces of the tongue. This should be regarded as a palate muscle as opposed to a tongue muscle because it's supplied by the pharyngeal plexus which we define as 9, 10 and sympathetic. Indeed one might ask is it the 9, the 10 or the sympathetic that supplies the muscle? Well, it certainly isn't the sympathetic because these are striated muscles. It certainly isn't the glossopharyngeal because that only supplies one muscle, the stylopharyngeus, and therefore it must be 10. But of course 10 is normally regarded as a pure parasympathetic nerve, but it does of course carry the motor fibers from the cranial root of the accessory. So we can regard the tongue as a mass of skeletal muscle covered by a mucous membrane. It's divided functionally and of course embryologically into an anterior two-thirds and a posterior one-third. And this division is by the sulcus terminalis. This is a V and the open part of the V points anteriorly. Just anteriorly to the sulcus terminalis and lying officially in the anterior two-thirds of the tongue are the large circumvallate papillae. These tiny little round lumps of tissue have like a moat around them and within that moat there are taste cells. Again, although they lie in the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, they are supplied by branches of the glossopharyngeal nerve. The rest of the posterior third of the tongue is quite smooth the thin mucosa has the lingual tonsil lying beneath it. There are few, if any, actual taste buds on the surface of the posterior third, but there are, of course, taste buds along the edges of the posterior third and up the palatoglossal and palatopharyngeal arches. These, again, are supplied by the glossopharyngeal nerve. General sensation on the posterior third of the tongue is also supplied by the glossopharyngeal nerve. So in summary, on the posterior third of the tongue, it is smooth, this is ideal for swallowing, there are no papillae, there is the lingual tonsil, and it lies within the oropharynx. The anterior two-thirds, meanwhile, is in the mouth itself. There are papillae of both the filiform and the fungiform type. The filiform are for grip, and the fungiform are for taste. The tongue otherwise consists of a stratified keratinizing squamous epithelium. It's worth noting that the filiform papillae are made up of little bits of keratin. In health, when the mouth has been used for eating, these little tips of keratin are swept off and the tongue will look healthy and red. But when the tongue has not been used for eating, they will become elongated and become white and finally if they dry out they'll even become brown. So it's not surprising that someone who's not eaten for a while and is really quite ill will end up with what only amounts to a brown hairy tongue. The tongue is supplied by the lingual artery. This is a branch of the external carotid that passes deep to hyoglossus to reach the tongue. As far as lymph drainage is concerned, the tip drains to the submental glands on both sides, whereas the dorsum goes unilaterally to the submandibular glands. In the posterior part of the tongue, drainage is down to the jugulo-omohyoid and deep cervical groups. 
We've mentioned the oropharynx earlier in this podcast, so just now let's look carefully at the definition of it. It extends anteriorly as far as the palatoglossus arch, which is a ridge produced by the palatoglossus muscle, and it extends posteriorly to the three constrictors that make up the posterior wall at this level. It is limited superiorly by the tip of the soft palate, the uvula, and it is limited inferiorly by the tip of the epiglottis. But we must include the area that lies between the posterior third of the tongue and the epiglottis, which is the vallecula. Between the palatoglossal arch and the posteriorly placed palatopharyngeal arch is the tonsillar fossa. Here lie the palatine tonsil on each side. Deep to the tonsil lies the glossopharyngeal nerve, which is the nerve supply for the whole of the oropharynx, both for general sensation and for taste. At this point, let us note that on removal of the tonsils, one can get referred pain from the glossopharyngeal nerve to the middle ear, because the middle ear itself is also supplied by the glossopharyngeal nerve. Laterally, deep to the tonsillar fossa, is the internal carotid artery. The palatine tonsil is clearly important because it is a fairly common operation to have one's tonsils and adenoid removed. It has mucosa over the tonsil and there's some 20 tonsillar crypts. Deep to it, apart from the structures that we've already mentioned, are the superior constrictor and the facial artery with its branches. It is in fact supplied by the tonsillar branch of the facial artery. It has a plexus of veins in its capsule and these drain down to the pharyngeal plexus of veins. In part, the tonsil develops from the second pharyngeal arch. Its lymphatic drainage is to the deep cervical and jugulodigastric, which are classically tender and enlarged with tonsillitis. Let's just remember that we have a circle of lymphatic tissue around the opening of the mouth and nose. This is called Waldau's ring, and it consists superiorly of the adenoid in the nasopharynx, the lingual tonsil below midline, and then the two tubal tonsils associated with the opening of the eustachian tubes, and the two palatine tonsils that we have just been talking about. Let's finish this podcast with a set of rules which you may find helpful. If we look, for instance, at the pharynx, we find that all the muscles are supplied by the pharyngeal plexus, 9, 10 and sympathetic, except stylopharyngeus, which is supplied by the glossopharyngeal nerve. Then we could look at the palate and say that, again, all the muscles are supplied by the pharyngeal plexus, except tensor palatae, which is supplied by the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve. Then we could look at the tongue and say all the muscles are supplied by the hypoglossal nerve, apart from palatoglossus, which again is supplied by the pharyngeal plexus. We could look at the facial expression and include buccinator and find that all the muscles are supplied by the facial nerve except levator palpebri superioris which is supplied by the ocular motor nerve. Then we could look at the muscles of mastication and say that they're all supplied by the mandibular division of the trigeminal apart from buccinator which is supplied by the facial nerve. And lastly, although we haven't previously described the larynx, we could say that all the intrinsic muscles of the larynx are supplied by the recurrent laryngeal nerve, apart from cricothyroid, which is supplied by the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. And with that summary, we'll finish this particular podcast on the mouth and moropharynx.